as you're, uh, before we start the presentations, I'm going to ask everyone to try to keep their presentations short and concise as you can. I know that some of these are pretty big, and that may be more dif difficult than others, but uh, we have four major topics, and we and not commit not talking about committee updates or department ed updates, and we only have an hour. So uh, if you could get through your presentation in 10 or 15 minutes, um, the quicker the better so that council would have time to ask questions as well. Uh, so with that, we'll start off with a presentation of the findings for the water distribution system upgrades with Jacobs, in Jacobs Engineering and Mr. Whitman. Jay? Uh, good afternoon. Um, this is a culmination of this uh, contract that we enacted uh, with Jacobs Engineering to do modeling to see who, what the best way both short term and long term uh, to get our water production up. Uh, this is unrelated to the uh, problems that we've had for the most part, but it is necessary for us uh, because we're growing. So without saying much more, if you don't have any questions for me, I'm going to bring these two gentlemen up, let them introduce herself. And they do have a, um, a PowerPoint that they will show you, and I'll be here to answer any questions you have. All right? All right. Thank you, Jay. Afternoon, uh, I know many of y'all, David State School um, with, the, uh, with Jacobs uh, Engineering. I'm going to follow the chair's advice and go very quickly through this, but entertain any questions you may, you may have. So we were brought in to basically expand upon the work we did back in 2012 to update the steady state hydraulic model for uh, Fairhope to an extended period simulation model to calibrate it and then to analyze your system. I had several questions at the, the front. Uh, one question we were asked was, does Fairpath have sufficient uh, storage of uh, potable water to meet uh, their, their city size? Based on AWA's uh, recommendation, uh, the city should have about 5.3 million gallons of storage, and you currently have 6.6. .6. So unless we have an isolated issue with, with pressure in a part of town, you have adequate storage to meet uh, AWA's uh, recommended storage for uh, your your, your system size, your fire flow and emergency uh, storage. Um, we were, of course, next thing we looked at was uh, your existing uh, water, water well capacity. As you will see on this uh, graph, um, truck around about four, uh, four and a half million gallons per day annual average until about uh, 14. You ramped up from about four to about almost six in 2019 with a max month uh, average daily demand of 7.8 million gallons per day 2019. Mm -hmm. We also noted you had about uh, 1.4 million gallons a day of unaccounted for water. Uh, basically water difference with what you produced in your wells and your pumps, your plants versus what you uh, build to your, uh, your customers. Various reasons for that I can go into those later if you have uh, questions about, uh, about that. So looking at the well capacity themselves, you have six uh, water plants uh, with various number of wells that pump into a reservoir, which then is pumped with a service pump into your distribution system. One of those is going to govern, the smaller one of the two governs your capacity, as well as we did some field work and observed the overall capacity of your system. Your max capacity is 9.1 million gallons per day. Your firm capacity, which basically is your capacity, your largest pump out of service, which is what EPA recommends your liability resiliency criteria, about 7.4 million gallons per day. So again, remember you're about 7.8 max day in 19, 7.4 firm capacity. So at your firm capacity slightly below your, your max uh, day demand or monthly average day, day demand for your system 2019. Mm -hmm. How's ways to, uh, to fix that? Um, probably one of the immediate things you see back here on this prior slide on well three your wells produce about 1750 gallons per minute, but you can pump about 1150 into your system, mainly due to some pressure concerns at the, uh, at the tank at Canterbury 33. You have the valve adopter doctor in high demands, and you can pump that water all the way back into town, which imparts uh, more back pressure on your pump. It would cause it to produce less, uh, less water. If we went in and installed a 16-inch uh, uh, line from that well on 33 to Fairp Avenue, and tied into the 12 and the 6 that's sitting there, um, you would basically add about 400 gallons per minute to your capacity, about half a million gallons per day. Gets you to about uh, 
eight, seven point nine of a firm uh, capacity. As you can see, uh, you may know the, the line from there through Fairup Avenue down to Nichols is your big backbone core of your water system. So it gets that water into your main part of your system. Also, that line would allow you in the future, if you need to, to increase the capacity of your well to about 2,500 uh, gallons per minute and still get that water into your system with some modifications to your operation. The other question we were asked to look at was some uh, reoccurring main breaks along Greeno Road, Highway 98. So the area concern shown on the uh, on the, the slide, basically between Twin Beach Road and Cain Road 32. As you'll note, you have three wells, wells four, five, and six that all pump into that line. We monitor that uh, those pressures over a period of about a month. You see the pressure vary quite frankly. As low as about 20 uh, psi, as high as about 100 psi. And if you back on the prior slide. Well, quickly, you will notice that your well capacity and your pump capacity, well capacity is smaller than pump capacity, which means those pumps are pumping out of the well, out of the reservoir, draining it, turning off, the well fills it back up, they pump, drain it, turn off. So it cycles about two or three times an hour. So if you look at this section of pipe here, you got four, three wells that are pumping off and off on Three, two or three times uh, an hour at the max, uh, max time, which causes constant surging and pressuring in that line. Combined with your staff observes some uh, suboptimal uh, trench uh, and uh, bedding uh, practices within wall PVC, it's a great recipe for uh, pipe, uh, pipe failures. So how do we address that, uh, that, that problem? There's some minor mods you can do. We can make some adjustments, or you can, your staff can, to the, uh, to the check valve uh, to allow it to open and close slower, which will help mitigate uh, those surges. Not a, not a lot of help, but, but some help for very minimal effort. Um, your, your wells have soft starts, so they start a little slower. Once they stop, the pressure uh, bottoms, bottoms out. You can install uh, surge tanks on your uh, three wells, well four, five, and six, to dampen those, uh, those surges, which will uh, help. But still, you'll have the repeated on and off of your, uh, of your service pumps because they don't match your well pump. You can take some more uh, additional steps of actually trying to match those flows by throttling the valve or putting an orifice plate. That's a, uh, it's a solution, but static. You make one selection, you're kind of stuck unless you want to replace it with another orifice plate or adjust your throughout your uh, valve positioning. Of course, the other more flexible way is to uh, put a, a VFD on your service pumps and allow it to operate to maintain a certain level in your, uh, in your clear well so that it doesn't have its own offs. And that, that will definitely help to, uh, to mitigate the, uh, the issues you're seeing along, uh, along Greenwood Road. Again, that's not exactly economical, very cheap solution, um, but it would uh, take care of those, those problems. So overall, uh, recommendations. Uh, were to uh, install the 16-inch main from Well Water Treatment Plant 3 to Fairp Avenue. Probably one and a half uh, million dollars be a rough estimate for, uh, for that line, including, uh, including all uh, construction and non-construction cost. Uh, go ahead and uh, adjust the uh, check valve and look at possibly throttling those valves at the uh, plant 4, 5, and 6 temporarily to see if that gives you some relief and to assess in your, uh, your path forward. And then long term or more short term for more long term is look at a water system uh, master plan to evaluate uh, increasing, uh, upgrading the size of water plant uh, three. Um, water plant one is more centrally located and based on some discussions with uh, your staff and others, uh, that, uh, that plant could probably see another well which would increase your capacity uh, there. It requires upgrades to your, to your plant, but to get that water back more centrally located into your, uh, your system. And look at your, uh, your system. Instead of uh, expanding and, and, uh, and just based on what your current needs are, look at long term what needs to be done with your system. Look at putting um, some out to valves to control closing your tanks at both your County Road 33, County Road 3, Section Street, and your 3 million gallon tank near, uh, near Walmart. So that's uh, very brief and quick, but can talk for much longer. Any questions you may, uh, you may have? Questions, Council? before I dive into the engineering discussion. Lawyers Looking first. Looking forward to that. 
Yeah, I think my first question will be, where is that additional one million gallons coming from? Well, what you're doing is you're moving the, uh, the back pressure with a bigger line, the pressure reduces, and the pump then pumps further right on its curve as a terminology, which means it pumps in more flow. So it doesn't, it just less, less back pressure allows more flow. Pumping through a small straw, now a big straw. You can suck a lot of water through a big straw than a small straw. Councilman, right now it's throttled back. We can't run wide open because we will create way too much maintenance issues, broken lines and stuff. So we're throttled back. Um, and that's what he was showing you. We have the potential to pump more there, but we don't have the potential to get it out into our system. And that's what this is going to do for us. Okay. All right. Would five million gallons more by putting in the new 16 inch line help with the pressure we're seeing on Greeno Road as far as the capacity usage? Half million gallons more, not five million gallons more. I'm sorry, half million gallons per I said. day. Okay. Um, not uh, significantly on Greeno Road because right. that water is going to Fairfax Avenue. It's a long right. way back over to Greeno Road. So I don't see any negligible impact on, on Greeno. Now, if you get further you know, northwest, you may see some improvements because you keep, tank, uh, keep the tank near the old school, um, mm -hmm. Fuller, which would help out some, but that's probably your biggest benefit. A couple of quick questions. Uh, the 1.4 million gallons per day or 25% unaccounted for. I, I don't know why that jumps out. Is that, is that, is that due to leaks? Is that due to unaccounted for? Uh, is that customers? It's, you know, that we're not charging? Where, where, that's a big number. Where, where, where do you think that's coming from? It's probably from a variety of things. Uh, most common, it's probably old uh, water meters or that aren't reading correctly. Water meters slow down over time. So replacing a water meter is going to often see 10, 15% increase in uh, juice readings because they just inherently slow down. Uh, it could be deal with uh, tracking of, you know, fire hydrant, people that put fire hydrants, connect them up to get water. It could be that. It could be some, uh, some leakage. It could be billing errors that exist. Not errors, more of a billing cycle issues that exist. There's a variety of reasons. At that, uh, that rate, I have to think it's tied to water meters reading uh, too slow. And from our experience, when those have been replaced, uh, they see a significant increase mm -hmm. in the amount of water billed. Not that it's billing much, not more water flowing through it, it's just more accurately accounting for that water. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think that you'd ever get to 100% efficiency in measuring, but what is a typical number that we should have in losses there? It, it, half that or less. I'd say if you're in the 10% or less. 10% or less. Uh, that would be uh, probably acceptable. Uh, if you're above, above that, you're in the action level. Uh, you can get down probably in the seven, eight percent, six percent range, uh, but you're right. You never get to uh, zero percent. It's just that's um, very difficult to do. If, in your opinion, if we were to uh, install a new well to go with uh, the, the, the WDP number one and, and new pumps, how far out? How many how many years of service is that going to buy us? It depends how much water you can get out of. Well, uh, well, one. Uh, I don't know that. With get with uh, the Dan O'Donnell, is y'all's uh, well, well guy to ask him that question. Um, but I don't know, Jay, if you talk, if you recall that answer. Well, it just so happens we replaced well one, as you're all aware, and it's way too fast. Um, with the same setup we had when it was installed 19, 20 years ago, uh, we gained 260 gallons per minute. Now we can't do that because it's permitted for it. But there is a ton of water there, an absolute ton of water, and it's. Uh, not significantly deep. So uh, Mr. O'Donnell had told all of us, I think we were at that meeting, that that's certainly one of the areas he'd look to, and also three, uh, which is the one that we want to start with putting the 16-inch line in. So uh, both those well fields are excellent. Um, just to let everybody know, there's a, there's a test well that we keep at all the sites uh, uh, so we could do draw, you know, see what we're, we're working on as far as uh, you know, drawing the water down too much, too fast, mm -hmm. how fast is it recurring? And we haven't, over the years, I think we, six inches is what Dan said. I think it was, so we've only lost six inches through the whole thing. And you know, it, that's- So you know where the bottom is? Oh yes, well, yes, Dan O'Donnell does. He maps all that for us. Yes, absolutely. 
So you say you've lost six inches over the years out of, I mean, I, give me an idea. Are we talking 20 feet? feet? We're talking three no, feet? No, it's 40 feet. 30, 40 feet yeah, of 40 height, feet. and we lost six inches? Yeah, yeah there's six inches. That's, 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 that's it's nothing. nothing. Right. That's it's tough. absolutely nothing. He was amazed the last yeah. time he did the drawdown that, you know, and he said that that well field at ones particularly is really strong, and three also. Okay. And then one just one last question, just because I'm curious. Uh, so on the uh, variable frequency pumps, it seems like if you put uh, check valves or any kind of orifice in there that restricts the flow, you're, you're, you're probably taxing your pump a lot because they're going to be running, you know, the same strength. You, you did say throttling back, but I don't know if you can actually throttle those pumps back. I don't know if they run at one speed or if they're if they, but the variable speed is is I think the state of the art that would, yeah. and they last a lot lot yeah. longer. And they, they just are designed to run continuously from an energy usage. For certainly, you're using a throttle valve orifice, you're burning electricity because you're burning head. So, yes, a VFD is much more efficient. It matches the curve. That's no question um, that that is definitely a more efficient way of going than to put an orifice or put in a throttle valve. You can throttle it, different kind of valve than you got there now. You can throttle it, which what you're doing now a little bit on well uh, water plant three. But I agree, that's not the best way of go, but it's more economical than VFDs, okay. capital cost wise at least. That's all my questions. Council, any other questions? Next steps? Any steps we're waiting on? Okay. Uh, we just need to uh, get the capital for it and get going on it. I mean, this is not going to be a major project this first bit. And uh, we'll work on the VFDs and see what they're going to cost us. Um, I haven't had a chance to look at it. We would like to um, try to find an in industry standard on that. I do like the fact that uh, with the variable speed drive, I can match what's coming out of the well. So even if they start to slow down, they won't shut all the way off, and maybe we could come back and look at the pressures. I think that that's, you know, it's certainly going to have a massive effect on, you know, what we're seeing out there now. Mm -hmm. I originally thought that we would be able to, to, for lack of a better way to say it, punch more holes in the line, put feeds down streets to take some of it off. But this is going to be in the long run, better and uh, and a lot easier for us to, but, you know, the VFDs, I think that we could come close to installing ourselves, you know, especially maybe not the, all of them, but the, after we get the first one done, we start matching, you know what we're looking at. I mean, we we have VFDs on the new fail system uh, lift, sta uh, lift station we have downtown, so we are familiar with, and we have several at the plant. So once we got it going, I think we could do it, okay. you know, no problem. All right. Thank you. Jack, I got one question. Yes, sir. You're saying this is going to add half a million more gallons? That's correct. The 60-inch line will give half a million more gallons back to, into the system and back into town. I guess I'm going back to Councilman Boone's question about, you know, we know we've got issues on Greeno Road with the water main there. Wouldn't it be more prudent to fix those issues we have rather than increase, I mean, according to the available and what's recommended, we're fine capacity-wise, correct? No, I think you're, yeah, I think right now you're, you're short capacity wise. You are, which I think you probably realized in, in the May time frame. So you're, uh, you have plenty of storage capacity. You don't have okay. enough you know, regular water capacity. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. Okay. Ms. Mazur? A presentation on Fairhope Docks vision plan and cost. Yes. Um, you have the place in front of you the vision plan phase, four phase um, process for renovating. You have in front of you the future of Fairhope uh, that we're recommending, the Fairhope Docks. And you'll have on the screen what we had when we took the property back in 2017 and what we have been doing over the two years and eight months that we've been managing the marina. I will hand out the dollars to you momentarily. I didn't want to give them to you first because I wanted you to watch what we were doing because I knew you would all look at the dollars. <laughs> um, if we start at phase one, that is necessarily our first phase because it is the dry storage uh, facility and all of the amenities we need with it um, because that is a revenue, revenue generating phase and we need that in order to move on to the others. So that is phase one. Um, we've discussed dry storage for quite some time. It, uh, that is the route that we're recommending that we go. Um, 
it is something that we're going to be asking for for funding in the 2021 budget. We have put in for a 100% GOMESA grant, but everything in phase one is not applicable to that grant. It doesn't meet its requirements. So that's, that's our nut. Um, it will generate significant revenue for us to keep uh, renovating the marina. You will notice, too, that I have crossed off the words painting area in phase one. We will not be doing painting. We are supplying four slots for small repairs. People can put their boats on the hard, and um, they can wax the bottoms of the boats. They can change props, any type of small repair, but there will not be any painting down at the Fairhope docks. That's just a toxic area we don't want to get into. Um, that also, although minor, that is also revenue generating for us uh, because you don't put your boat on the hard without paying for that space while you're there. It keeps the boats moving out and letting new ones come in for work and it keeps them from getting free storage space. Um, phase two is pretty much land side. Um, and a lot of the work in phase two has been done. In fact, that's where we've got the new bulkhead along the A docks and the new larger finger piers along the A docks. Um, <clears throat> we took out the haul out cell and continued the bulkhead over and, and attached that to the fuel dock. That is the area, the old haul out cell that we talked about turning into the poor man's yacht club. I'm now putting that in the option category because we've managed to turn that slot into a slip and it is occupied and it is generating some revenue we had not expected to get. On top of which, it's not always all about revenue, but we did rebuild the hangout area down there and it's larger and greatly improved and that has been a significant area for our boaters to gather socially and now with the larger space I think that's going to take um, care of the social issues for the boaters for some years to come so that while visually wonderful and I loved it the poor man's yacht club is something that we can wait on there's no other project that's attached to it it doesn't have to be built in order to go to someplace else so that becomes um, something we can talk about in the future phase three is the pervious surface parking and the sea dock and the seating gallery. Now the seating gallery is an instance of uh, something that qualifies for the grant that we put in for. And the things that, that are in the, the grant request cross over our phases, so we are flexible. Uh, we can accomplish the seating gallery without having to wait to finish phase one and phase two. So those things are out there and possible. The bulkhead work isn't as extensive there as it has been in the other areas. So that will be phase three and phase four is our beach improvement area, which the beach improvement itself is also in our grant request. That's also where we're talking about uh, placing our icon lighthouse on our recommended vision here. Out there, we have already reinforced the jetty. We've rebuilt G dock. We've rebuilt sections of F dock. And we've come in with, with bulkheads there. And we have gotten two more transient slips out of that area as a result of the work that we've done. Now, quickly, I'm going to give you the numbers. And then we'll talk about them. Now you'll note that this is the uh, preliminary estimate cost. The items highlighted in light blue are those items that are in the grant request. And we will know in the fall whether or not we've been given that request. The second page is everything that went then in, into that request. There are, it's $6.6 .6 million project from start to finish. That's not including the work that we've already done. The grant is $2.4 million. Now, I feel compelled to tell you, just to take the gasp away from the pricing, um, I ran some numbers today, and I think we should be very proud of what we've done in the two years and eight months since we've opened up. We started selling fuel in June of 2018, 
And from that point to the end of the month of May 2020, we sold $535,891 worth of food, fuel, and that excludes sales tax. That's already been taken out. Yeah. Fiscal year to date. Can you say that number one more time? I'm sorry. 585,891, exclusive of sales tax, from June 18th to the end of month of May. And already this fiscal year to date, we are 78% ahead in fuel sales versus the same period last year. Now, the slip revenue started October 15th, 1917, and through June, because we collect in advance, we have collected $456,500 in slip rentals exclusive of sales tax. And then there have been some inc incidental income related to the ice machine we have down there and some items in the uh, ship store that is still being developed. But in two years and eight months at the Fairhope docks, we've had a revenue of almost a million dollars versus expenses of a million point three eighteen. And I think for that period of time, um, we're really happy that we've been able to add that much to covering our costs of operation down there. And those expenses are everything from capital investment to personnel. So yes, 6.6 .6 million looks like a lot. It isn't something we're expecting to do overnight or within the next 24 months. Um, it will take time to accomplish this, but this is the vision that we have. This is what we're recommending, the direction that we take. Um, and we are, after all, repairing 30 years of neglect. So it's taking time and it's taking a lot of thought and a lot of work. Comments? Council? I appreciate your work down there. It certainly looks better. I ride down there every once in a while just to check the progress and, and I really do appreciate what you've done. Um, any, I guess it's pretty early on, but have you done some projections on what you think you would generate from a dry slip? I mean, I know we've seen some presentation on that before, but. Yes, um, interestingly enough too, you know, the, the, um, the visual concept was presented at the State of the City mm -hmm. and it was received very well there. And as a result of that, we already have some people who've come down to the marina, put their names on a waiting list. <laughs> um, we re we've run figures and now with a new total figure, taking a look at not just the building itself, but everything else that's involved, including reinforcing the, uh, the splash area, the bulkhead and, and all of that, the pad that needs to be poured, all of that and the forklift. Um, our figures are coming in if we're charging based on a 30 foot boat at $11 a foot per boat. Um, we're looking at a four and a half best case scenario with 100% occupancy payback to tw years, that is, to 12 and a half years payback at the worst case scenario, that's a 25 foot boat and 50% occupancy. The reality of life is somewhere in between, but it isn't, we're looking at six figure income every year with the exception of having only 25 foot boats at 50% occupancy. That's the only time we drop below the six figure. Ms. Mays, when you say four and a half to 12 and a half year payback, that mm -hmm. is for just for that dry storage and the forklift? What, yes, what is that, that, in, that includes everything from the building to the forklift to the cement pad to that entire phase so one phase construction. One, so fa phase one payback. Right. Okay, great. And as I said, you know, it sounds scary. Um, when we looked at dry storage, they mostly have 90 to 95 percent capacity and there's no reason why we wouldn't have the same. To think that we would have a building with only 50 percent capacity is, is silly. It just, that's not out there. The demand is, is out there for the dry storage. You know, we've talked about this before, Ms. Major, and I, you know, uh, we've seen this, uh, some of this uh, presentation and, and even a little more visual than this even. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, the phase one, I'm, I'm a big fan of, and, and I'm a, a pretty big fan of phase two, and phase three, you gotta do something, and phase four, eh, maybe. It's a pretty big price tag. You, you start reaching diminishing returns after you get past mm -hmm. that phase one. Um, it's, a, it's a mighty expensive project. Uh, of course, if you can get grant money, we you know, will be looking phase, every year 
every year we're looking for grant money, and uh, even if we get it this year, we'll continue looking for more grant money. You don't happen to have that phase two price broken down, do you? Um, I can tell you which of the elements in there are included in phase two. It would be the mobile buildings. Uh, that's when we take down the existing buildings in those mobile buildings, um, five of them. Now, they're going to be different sizes, but uh, you should have that is uh, building structures, the cottages. It's listed under buildings and structures. You have that figure. I think that's high. We're using them. One will be the ship store and marina office. The other one will be the bathrooms for men and women. Um, then one for laundry. So that's going to be a much smaller building. One will be for storage for the marina, because once we remove the other buildings, we need storage. And the fifth one, <coughs> excuse me, the fifth one that's illustrated there, we've started talking recently. We have requests for dock boxes and lockers, which we do not permit. We don't have wide docks, so we're not permitting them at the moment. But it occurred to us that having that fifth building there, where we can have uh, lock boxes and lockers in there, for uh, for rent and they garner 25 to 65 dollars a month depending on the size and then they're out of sight but they're still available to the boaters who want them what else is that i see um, another cotton phase two see that's what so much is done we will have is landscaping that, uh, for instance is that slip that cover slip roof replacement in there phase two uh that covered slip replacement is under the grant and that is, I'm, I'm sorry, that is, that's a big number. I'm not that's sure where. That's a huge where, number, yeah. That kind of jumps out at you. Yeah, it, it's huge. And I, I don't understand why that, because we would be covering it with the same roof that's on the hangout. And that's just not going to get to that point. I, I don't know where that number came from. Um, unless there's some structure involved in that, but we've looked at it and we Four, don't see it. 464,000 for those of you that no. can't see the paper. No. That, that's that's out of line, but that's in in the grant. If we don't get the grant, I can promise you right now that's going to drop by 75 percent at the yeah. minimum. Okay. So there could be some value engineering. Oh, there's a lot those. of value engineering that can yeah. be done in this. Absolutely. And we've been using in-house, and I, I have to tell you, um, they save us tens of thousands of dollars. Our guys doing a lot of the work. They're doing the electrical down there now. That they've been down there overseeing um, the project. Yeah, having having our own engineering, it, it has saved us a lot of money. And they've done a super job. They understand our needs. They talk with us. They they know what we want. They're they're there, ready and willing to to get it done. And they've done a super job. It's great working with the guys. Uh, Ms. Mazur, do you want some kind of direction, just give what us an I, update? What, what, what we're looking for is, is your nod that, yeah, th this is the direction we'd like to go in. Um, this is the concept that, that you're in agreement with. We would, of course, you know, everything we're coming back to you for. I mean, at any point in time, you can say, no, wait a minute, that's, that's not worth it. But we, as we go through all of this, for example, the, the phase one, you'll see every single dime that's going to be coming up in the 2021 budget. And I can tell you right now, um, we're including the forklift, but in all honesty, I've learned how slow things churn in the city. And since we don't know when the budget will get, uh, get passed, and then you go out for bids for all the different phases. We have to get the engineered drawings. We go out for bids. We look at the bids. By the time we get started, there's no point in owning a forklift before you're ready to use it. I don't see that happening until the 22 budget, frankly. Well, I'll go first. Right. I'll just say that, um, you know, I like the plans. I don't, I don't know that I like the price tag for all of it, and I don't know, you know, that I'm crazy about four so much maybe something but you know i don't know lighthouse 300 grand i don't know phase three maybe fancy but as far as phase one goes and to a little bit lesser degree you know i, I i'm personally i know that there's going to be some difference of opinion up here i'm personally in favor of moving forward with phase one uh and, and you know I, but i would like to see some 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 real cost quotes and you know and have the ability to, mm -hmm. you know, sharpen the pencil on that if, if need be. Oh, I, yes. I think on the, the two key components, which is the 
proposed dry storage facility and the, and the forklift, I think you've got very reasonable numbers on those. And, and in fact, on that forklift, if you could find a really good use one, it could be, you know, a good bit less. Than good that. Le yes. And, and we're looking, Randy is out there all the time looking right. for us, um, checking on, on used forklifts. It's always easy to get a new one, but uh, picking up a, a used one. So he's keeping his eye open for us. We are all about at every point in time, saving money where we can. This is, you know, preliminary. If we got everything we wanted, we could do it tomorrow. This is what, what it's going to cost us, but not necessarily everything that's here is going to get done. You know, for, and I, I think the Poor Man's Yacht Club is the perfect example of something that went from a cost that presents us with nothing to something that gives us revenue at, this, at the marina, which makes far more sense uh, right now. Maybe sometime 10 years from now, somebody will say, let's, let's do the Poor Man's Yacht Club. We need it. But Mr. Boone? Well, personally, you know, I like it all the way across the board. I really like the fact that with your numbers coming in, you know, when we first started this, we had to get a plan going. That's the first thing. We got to right. get a plan. We finally got it work. You did a very nice job of getting this and getting this plan moved forward and getting a, a picturesque uh, design on it that we saw. And then you look at the fact that the what we have done, you know, with basically through your sheer effort, was is paid for 79 percent within mm -hmm. a year and a half. Yeah. I don't think we have anything in this town that does that. And so. And plus the fact that, you know, everybody, you're speculating on what it can do, and this far away surpassed what we thought it was going to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've thrilled. had nothing but uh, people talk to me about what the vast improvements that we've done down here. And, I, you know, I personally think this is what it's going to take in order to continue to take the financial burden in the long run off the city of Fairwood, where this thing will pay for itself. And actually, I think over a period of time, it'll help put money into the budget. I think so. Our goal city. is to be self-sufficient, absolutely. City marina, there's no reason for city marinas not to be. It takes some effort and some investment in the first place, but that's our goal. Well, like I say, when you do 79% paid for in the first year and a half, mm -hmm. I call that, that pretty darn good. Hey, I, Evan, I was surprised. I knew it was going to be good, yeah. but I was surprised that it was as good <laughs> as, as that. Well, it was an excellent job. We got, it. We got two more items. Uh, yeah. Councilman Brown? Yeah, unlike... Jack, I do like the lighthouse. <laughs> uh, Me too. We do that. But, you know, and back starting with phase one. Find your way home. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I haven't been a proponent for the dry storage from day one. I just think that needs to be done by, you know, a private, uh, private investor. Doesn't, it shouldn't be done uh, within the city. Mm -hmm. I mean, do we know what, what kind of lease we'd be able to get? We have no idea. No. Forward it. Because in all honesty, we disagree. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't, so we have not looked at that. I just think the liability, you know, for the city to be handling, you know, two hundred thousand dollars center consoles and and the liability of the facility itself, I just not a big fan of it. And, and hey, I appreciate that it looks great down there, the Marina. The the improvements that have been done, uh, you know, kudos to you and the staff. It look it looks good down there, but. That's just my only two on the on the phase one. I'm not a big fan of the city. I think you that. should be prepared that even if we were to look at leasing a facility like that out, we would have to provide the facility. We still have the expense. And like we we didn't go with the boatyard scenario because the city would never get its money back out of what it had to provide in order for somebody to set up business there. Um, and nobody's going mm -hmm. to invest that kind of money on city property knowing that when it's all over, said and done, it belongs to us, and that's what happens when you erect things on city property. I, I was approached by somebody two weeks ago about a public-private partnership on that exact idea, so I wouldn't necessarily throw it out of the window. Well, if you would share that name with me, I'll certainly research the, uh, the okay. cost and the, the potential for that. Will do. Thank you. Councilman Conyers. Um, again, I think Lynn's done a great job and, and staff on fixing this area up and, and moving in the right direction. I'd just like a little more time personally to maybe digest some of the numbers and, and think through the process. But in general, I'm, I mean, I like the direction you're headed. And I agree with Robert. I, I kind of like the lighthouse idea. And we actually have a slip holder who came over to me the other day and said he has some connections with lighthouses, new use and otherwise, and he would be very happy to help us find one at a beneficial price. Let me be clear. I like lighthouses. I just don't know that <laughs> the I like $365,000 yeah, lighthouses I hear and you. props. I hear you on that. I just, again, yeah, I'd like to just digest those numbers. But, but thank you for everything you've done. 
It's been my pleasure. It really has been. Councilman Robinson. Sure. Yeah, Lynn, the pictures look great. The design looks great. Um, but I kind of agree with Jimmy that I'd like to see a little bit more kind of what the concrete costs are going to be as we start looking to move forward with mm -hmm. it. Um, you know, there are a lot of big numbers here. I, yeah, I, did, I did appreciate how you kind of walked us into it and got us excited about the project and then gave us the price. That's, <laughs> that's not a bad idea. But no, I, I would like a little, just a little more definitive pricing on some of this stuff and to see kind of, you know, how much we're looking at over okay. what period of time before we get to where we're wanting to go. My my problem with that, I don't, and I have no issue with, you know, updating the prices as we go along, and they'll certainly be updated all along, but this gets stretched out. I think our most immediate pricing would be phase one. Then as we're doing phase one, we can look at phase two and start getting some real pricing on that. But like I said, none of this is fixed. These are very flexible phases, so that if something happens along the way that it's more affordable to do one thing that's going that you know you all really like uh, better than something else. We can do that. So we have we have flexibility, and we will always be checking our pricing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks, Lynn. All right. Next item on the work session would be a presentation and a discussion of the Green Co. Clean Workforce courses and certifications. Mr. David Green. Thank you for taking the time not to roll back the clock to the previous presentation, but I, with respect to forklifts, if you just have one and it goes down on July 4th or Memorial Day weekend in a building full of boats, you might want to back up used one on site and a potential lease purchase on a new one. Just don't underestimate the importance of a negative lift forklift when it relates to dropping splashing boats in the water out of a dry storage. Just a cautionary tale. Not, not the reason I'm here, but uh, important thing to know. So, um, in light of the COVID response, I'm here to discuss with you a program uh, I've developed, as you may know as a lawyer, in decades of emergency management and disaster recovery response. Um, I took a special interest in the, and concern with respect to the lack of knowledge in the workforce related to coronavirus response and viral transmission. I then proceeded to dedicate months and working with a team of PhD professors, epidemiologists, subject matter experts around the country and uh, with a local uh, online university specializing in safety training and protocol, but with a global presence of 30 plus thousand uh, students. And this is part of a larger patent pending emergency management and disaster recovery response plan that I'm working on. Um, and what I've, where we are now is with Green Co. Clean, we have the city of Gulf Shores currently training municipal employees. Uh, they will be training their school system employees in their city schools. The city of Orange Beach adopted a resolution and is training employees. Alabaster City School System uh, was training 88 and contacted me and wanted to let me know that they're interested in training another 112 employees. Um, so I'll first go to the ask. I'll explain more about where we are and then I'll go back uh, to the ask. Um, the ask would be that the city of Fairhope consider uh, allocating funds, uh, whether existing in your budget for workforce training uh, and educational certification uh, in existing budgets, or taking the opportunity to get funds from those which are allocated and detailed from CARES Act funding through the Department of Finance in the state of Alabama to each municipality. Um, secondly, the second component, uh, and we have five courses of online curriculum available from free to train the trainer. They can all be done online. Uh, at a later date, we can provide on-the-job training and consulting services. Um, I would also ask that you consider joining other uh, legislators throughout the state and municipalities in asking the governor's office by and through their uh, coronavirus response committee to basically ease the process and make a statewide licensing in effect. Uh, it's more money, but it pushes the price down per person. Uh, you may be aware that I offered a discount on the curriculum uh, course, the primary course that the municipalities in this county and in others are taking. 
uh, to a $100 per person cost for a 90-day period. Uh, Summerdale, Orange Beach, and Gulf Shores uh, and Alabaster City Schools, for example, took that opportunity. We're also uh, working with other states as well. Uh, we've received a lot of support locally uh, from restaurant industry, um, even dental offices, the film and music indus uh, industry has been decimated with respect to workers' comp and insurance costs. Even if you can go back to work and things open back up, um, if you have the ability to obtain a bond to finance or workers' comp, it can be detrimental to the, the viability of financing certain types of projects and work. So um, we've been working on this for, for months. Uh, it's been well received, and I know now we're well into the, the world is opening back up phase. And I in no way, as a small business owner, have an interest in placing a burden on small business uh, or a prohibitive cost. Uh, but it, you need look no further than the recent report from the CDC, wherein they did a, conducted a survey, uh, and it's frightening the number of people that ingested chemicals and bleach and rubbed uh, disinfectants all over their bodies and other areas, believing that they were um, repelling or warding off or clearing themselves from viral transmission. Uh, this is published June 5. This is not old. This is new. So as we reopen our nation, we'll reopen our schools. You may or may not be aware that if we close our schools, it costs our nation $50 billion a month. I don't believe that that's sustainable. I don't believe that our nation will um, sit idly by uh, in a stand down position anymore. Um, I think that we did that and the, the curve has, has, we believed flattened, but if you look at the numbers, the cases continue to go up and the deaths continue to go up and we enjoy being in a, a high heat and a high humidity and a high sunshine area with a lot of outdoor activities uh, for residents and tourists and we're blessed and benefited by that. But when cold and flu season returns, it will uh, correspond with the time that we return to schools and congregating at football games and activities uh, and churches and other things and naturally that's when cold and flu season will reoccur. And in speaking with globally recognized uh, infectious disease specialists, there's a concern uh, that the numbers will, will go up substantially. Um, I subscribe to the uh, philosophy, generally speaking, that uh, if you believe in education, that you don't believe that it's appropriate to stop learning and you don't believe that it's appropriate to stop learning um, basic tasks and things that improve safety uh, throughout the community. We wear seat belts now. There was a time when people thought that is an in infringement of their civil liberties. We wear motorcycle helmets now. Um, while many uh, reject that as an infringement upon their freedom. But we do know that if you wear a seat belt and you wear a motorcycle helmet, you reduce the likelihood that a minor accident or incident will place you in an ambulance and in the hospital system. At the same time, if we educate and train practice and proper procedure protocols for standardization, for which none exist in the state of Alabama, we can potentially begin to educate the public and develop practices and procedures that become commonplace, like wearing a seatbelt or a motorcycle helmet, thereby indirectly benefiting our health and medical systems and reducing the number of people that find themselves in the hospital. And I'll remind you that since the cases are still going up and the number of deaths are still going up, um, it, it's, it's not an issue that's historical. It's an issue that's, that's uh, pretty important currently. So at, at a discounted cost to the uh, municipalities and of Baldwin County and school systems of $100 per employee, you could consider in educating all of the employees of the city or select by department heads those which you believe are more appropriately suited. Certain members of the fire department that take hazmat training might want to take higher levels of train the trainer, uh, whereas uh, public works, parks and recreation, uh, municipal facilities and maintenance, others might want to take certain uh, different levels. We can package that uh, for the city 
uh, the CARES Act funding as highlighted by the Department of Finance link on the comptroller's website for the state of Alabama outlines a pretty simple process and procedure whereby you can fill out a one-page application for funding and tap into the allocated funds to the city of Fairhope which are $907,742.40. I hardly think that at uh, up to a hundred or a few hundred dollars per employee, you would even scratch the surface of that eligible funding by training everyone in the city. So that's one option for the city participating in the program and allocating existing funds in the budget, which is what Gulf Shores and Orange Beach have done, take the opportunity to apply for available funds of the CARES Act, which are now available. This is a May 28th dated letter that y'all may or may not be aware of. Um, and then additionally, I would ask that you potentially support the request for a statewide license, in which case we will do statewide marketing, community outreach, um, radio, uh, webinars, outreach in the school systems, and it will be a much more comprehensive uh, program and thereby pushing the cost down to each individual throughout the state to maybe $30, $40, where we could educate and train more than a half a million uh, employees in the, in the cities, counties, state government, and school systems. That number's about 300,000, and clearly we could uh, train the private sector employees as well. So we have restaurants participating in it, uh, businesses, school systems, and municipalities, and I'm open for any number of questions you'd like to ask about it, um, but uh, we're excited about the uh, the process and the, pros the possibility that this could become widespread. We've received, by the way, in about the second or third week of March, the green light from the governor's office on this project to proceed. We've been working with AIDT, as you may know, which is workforce development in the state of Alabama. Um, all of their facilities were closed. Um, they'll begin a second phase uh, providing grant monies uh, for Green Co. to hire uh, these people to uh, help present this program beyond the online component throughout the state uh, or locally or regionally wherever it's adopted. So um, I know that's a mouthful, uh, but I know y'all have three or four uh, key items that you wanted to get to today and I didn't want to dominate the time. Councilman Robertson, questions? I don't have any. Good presentation. I'd like to see more of what's in that letter. I was not aware of it. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah. Councilman Conyers. I don't really have any questions. Thank you, though, David. Mm -hmm. Appreciate the presentation. Yeah, my pleasure. Councilman Brown. Yeah, thanks for coming today, David. And, you know, this is, I guess, the personnel training is in the mayor's wheelhouse, but I appreciate you coming just so we could all hear your presentation and, and see what's available. And, you know, I think training, like you said, getting something that's universal where everybody's not clinging to a different standard uh, where it might not make a difference is a, is a good idea. So, anyway, thanks for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. Councilman Boone. <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I think about it is with all the different sy systems that fix this problem, it'd be nice to have one that probably work. That that that's my my plan. I hope yeah, I hope I, to have that opportunity. I like that idea. So I, I'll give you one example real quick. That um, you know we're currently uh, recovering, about to complete the recovery of a tornado project outside of Chattanooga for a county, and there's certain pre procedures, training protocols that always take place in all type of recovery. Uh, if you work in the state of Georgia and you work on the state highways. Every person on the job, no matter what, must go through two, two full days of in-person, eight-hour training with a subject matter expert, demonstrating physically the ability and taking a written test that they are capable of flagging traffic for safety on the highways in the state of Georgia, all right? Become a card-carrying traffic flagger, all right? In the state of Alabama, I could disinfect every building as a cleaning company and all I have to do is tell you, don't worry, we follow the CDC guidelines. My argument is that there are many, many experts in professional cleaning companies, custodians, uh, lodging partners in hotels and condos at the beach, and school custodians that really know their job and do it well. But you can watch commercials on television of chemicals being sprayed on and immediately wiped off. And it's as though no one has read the contact time off the end list from the EPA which clearly would detail that it's no effect. 
So instead of doing a lot of work and having no effect, or being like Jefferson County and spending $900,000 to disinfect your school systems, I would argue that that's unsustainable. The federal tax money will run out, and the custodians in the school systems and around the cities will be none the wiser. So I think we owe it to ourselves to educate and train people so that it can become common knowledge, and we increase the, uh, the, the basic awareness, thereby increasing uh, safety. I thank you for your time. I haven't got to my questions yet. Yes, sir. <laughs> I go last, everybody, so hang on. Hang on a minute. Uh, real quick, um, mm -hmm. how, how long is the training? Where does the training occur, and do you come to us? Do they go to you? I, I hadn't heard any details on that. So the training uh, at this point is online, um, and there are modules that take anywhere from a few hours to in online educational training, you have things that are referred to as contact time. So that means if you read every document available, if you watch every video, if you go through every aspect of it, all the way to train the trainer might be 40 hours. But the primary uh, course for the municipal employee that's being taken uh, can be done in a half a day uh, or less. And so, and the videos and other things are available. Soon, uh, at, the, at the moment, Columbia Southern University is hosting this stuff online. It's available uh, for registration. You can go to the website, uh, greencoclean.com and find the information. You can look at the news section on that website and you can see the resolution from the city of Orange Beach. You can see an endorsement video from Mayor Robert Kraft of Gulf Shores and we'll be adding additional stuff re soon. But very soon we'll be rolling the hosting of this away from Columbia Southern and independently through Greenco. And at that time it'll be available on a mobile phone or um, other mobile device. Our goal with massive statewide funding will be to develop an app where this will be available with lots of notifications. This would be interesting potentially to you. So the courses are anywhere from a few hours to a week long or less, uh, depending upon the level uh, of those courses. If we're able to have the app with statewide funding, you could have push notifications from the city of Fairhope about safety procedures, protocols, for example, social distancing downtown, walking in shops, other sanitization, uh, disinfecting, things of that nature, respect to going to the parks and public spaces, those things be could become available to the public as they enter the city and come downtown. The funding we would, would provide that and it would be available and we could work with y'all to custom tailor that to send your message to people that visit here. So there's a lot of marketing and a tremendous consumer upside uh, on this. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Right. I'll take the opportunity to leave these documents with you. Oh, yeah, great. Any other questions? No, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Just hand them out. You'll start down there and just pass them down. Mr. White, if you want to make your way up here, we'll give you, we'll, we'll go beyond the, the work session. Good evening. I will try to simplify this and keep it to a minimum, but there's nothing really simple about it, so I'll do the best I can. Sure. Um, I'm really looking for, for guidance uh, on this. We, we've had some discussion about um, fee structures and uh, different ideas uh, to come up with for all of our sports facilities. Um, there's a, been a lot of discussion about soccer uh, but also we we need to have these things in place for all sports, baseball, softball, uh, and, and everything across the board. Uh, right now we are having 
you know, several issues in our parks with travel teams um, and private instruction um, at Founders and Volana. Uh, my understanding is Loxley and Daphne has really cracked down on travel teams, and so everybody's kind of flocking to us right now. Um, we're going to have our work cut out for us to try to police this stuff um, because obviously they know that my workforce goes home at 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the afternoon, so that's when everybody comes out. Um, but I will, I will figure that out. But to go through this information, basically what I've given you on the first sheet is a uh, fee structure that was uh, presented by the uh, rec board and approved by the rec board. Um, and you see there the, the fees they proposed is $50 uh, per field per day. Uh, and then if it were you know, something that required staff, like a softball tournament, uh, it would be $30 per man hour. Uh, and additional fees would be set on as needed case basis. Uh, we would require a $250 deposit um, at the time for application for tournaments. This is, this is um, what the rec board approved. Now this obviously applies to anybody that would classify as a uh, travel organization or um, any league that has paid staff or personnel. We're not talking about recreational leagues. Uh, that have solely volunteers running them. Uh, on the second sheet um, is um, some fees that, that uh, Marcus and I were working on earlier, just to give you guys some options. Uh, and in that, we included the $50 uh, per field per day, the $30 a man hour, but we also had some other additional fees in there, uh, $150 uh, for field setup or painting, lining, uh, the fields um, to get them ready, you know, for spring or fall season. Um, uh, Fifty dollars per hour for lighting. Uh, we're not receiving any any money currently for lighting, and and to be honest with you, our lighting is not metered, so there's really no way of me tracking exactly how much recreation is using as far as lighting and or water because neither one of them is is metered. Um, so that's the um, that's the two options with those. The third of, uh, form there is um, some different ideas of what we could be charging for uh, tournaments and or camps. Um, you see the different rates um, for founders, Manly, Barnwell, softball, and skate park. Basically, that would be an hourly rate to use the fields. Um, so that would be something else to consider. Also, uh, on page two of that, we, we get into some other uh, fees as far as vendor fees. Uh, if they were to have a vendor on site selling items or food, um, we would expect to receive a percentage there. Uh, and then you go into different fees for hard costs for us to run different tournaments. Um, Quick dry would be field conditioner. Uh, any facility damage, we would re require deposits up front. Obviously, that would be refundable. Um, and then, again, fees for, for lighting and staff members uh, and field setup and lining. Uh, on the last sheet that I gave you is basically an example of this would be the Manly Soccer Complex and how much field usage is currently being utilized out there by both recreation, um, league, and academy. Uh, this does not include um, the Gulf Coast Rangers, which is a totally separate uh, travel organization that has been operating out there um, in years past. So uh, that kind of gives you an idea of how much each entity is using the fields. Uh, obviously, the number at the bottom would reflect if, if we charged the $50 uh, per field per day and gave the academy the discounted rate uh, because they do help facilitate the recreational league. If we gave them the, the discounted rate, they would end up paying, um, what was it, Marcus, uh, $25? 
Yeah, basically that number would reflect what they would pay at the end of the year. So I guess I, in all that said, I'm looking to you guys for what direction you really want to go. Uh, do we want to keep it simple and, and you know, have the, the basic fee structure? Do we want to get into different fees for, um, you know, different services and things that we provide? Um, I'm basically looking to you guys. And I know we're not going to get any kind of resolution on this tonight because uh, we're going to have to decipher the, through this information. But I will tell you that um, the Academy Soccer Club has reached out to me. They want to start having camps on the 15th. Uh, and I'm also getting a lot of questions from both baseball and softball from private instructors and travel teams on what they need to do to be able to use our facility. So I'd really like to get you know, some of these fee structures in place so I can give them some information. Pat, the fee structure's pretty complicated, which, which doesn't bother me too much. I don't, I don't, I mean, I hear a lot of up here, you know, wanting to simplify things and, you know, and, and that's great, but, but sometimes it's, it's not always that easy to oversimplify right. it. But I want to go to something maybe a little bit simpler, and that is on uh, the, uh, the sheet that says approved by the rec board. Yes, sir. Number nine talks about the organization be considered inside the city. The organizer must show proof that at least 80% of the participants are residents of the city of Arrow. Right. Well, I mean, we have a lot of people that live in 36532 that aren't technically residents of the city of Arrow. So then I, I looked over and I thought you covered it. Number 12 on the fee structure option two says the organizer must show proof that at least 80% of the participants are residents of the city of Fairhope. And it says living in its school feeder pattern. So then you got them you got to still be a resident, but I think maybe that was something was supposed to be taken out of there. We're all talking kids here, right? Right. So there's no adult participation. So I would say that if they're all school age kids, it would just be if they live in the Fairhope feeder pattern. Feeder pattern. Because they may right. not go to a Fairhope school. They could go to uh, they go to Bayside. They could go to St. Michael's. They could go across the bay. Some some kids do. But they still play ball here in Fairhope. And, right. And that, that was one of the things that we made. You, you may be looking at the one that was approved versus the one that Pat and I kind of worked out uh, in addition. And that, we added that language in there within the Fairhope school feeder pattern. Those are the ones that are qualified to come in. They include in that 80%. Uh, not just a resident of the yeah city. well it says the one it says are residents of the city of fair living in its school feeder pattern i would just get rid of the words are residents i would just say are living in the school feeder pattern yeah. and, and then the, i agree with you. that's correct because that's, that's the intent of it and uh with regard to the, the one agreement that was approved we took out all the tournament language and placed it in a separate document and uh and left that just a the facility rental agreement uh, portion of it and then completely separated the tournament agreement. And we model this off of what Auburn has done with their facilities and their facility use agreements. And they actually kind of board play what they're doing. So was that option two? That's option two and also the tournament agreement. Okay. Uh, what is the City of Carroll, Carroll Park and Recreation Tournament Agreement to apply to tournaments and camps. Is that $50, you know, on that? Fifty dollar per hour for lighting too. That it, you know, it seems like we need to get a handle on what that really costs. That may be kind of arbitrary. If you've got ten fields out there or nine fields out there at the soccer complex, it's my organizer tournament. Yeah, I'd like to know what it costs. Uh, and, 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 it, and it lasts several hours in the evening. They're going to have a what is that four hundred and fifty dollar per hour bill. They're not going to be able to conduct a tournament out there. I don't think it seems uh, prohibitive. Metered and also if you're fall under that category of the nonprofit with your primary place of business here, you can get a discount off of that. I think that's what that reads. Some of those, you know, I, I can agree with some of these, but that one seems a little bit arbitrary and it needs a little work and it, it might be that it's just stricken and then uh, massaged or, or we could come back with some information in which we could put, put that in there, but that's that that's getting on up there and, and you know there's also the the argument to be made by citizens that say well you know that's why we pay taxes and so you do get certain amenities and there's a certain amount of usage that goes along with this and i guess you know we're not making any money on this we're losing it's all a losing right. proposition for the city but we have to we do they do 
we do offset the cost with, with tax revenues as, as well, I guess, what I'm, what I'm trying to say. These, Some of them. These don't apply to your recreation leagues. So your baseball, football, soccer, lacrosse, they're all rec. They're not paying any of these fees associated with this. These are all the private corporations that okay. come in and hold tournaments or have games on the outside. Do you think that uh, you may have people that um, will go out and just hire an attorney, achieve a nonprofit status? They're really not making a profit, but the coach is being paid, and they, they're really kind of violating the spirit of what a nonprofit is. But there, there's a lot of those types of uh, yeah, they are currently nonprofit. Around. They are nonprofit now. Right. Uh, but but again, you know, there's a lot of paid staff and, and coaches out there, and that's kind of what brought us to this point. Right. Well, uh, if, if if they if they maintain that nonprofit status, is it does it do anything to do these new fees do anything to alleviate the the, the issue of not getting any revenue? I guess. Well, it brings us basically what we talked about was it, it brings us into legality. You know, it's against state constitution law to um, to operate a corporation, nonprofit or not, where you have paid personnel out there on a tax paid facility. I think to answer your question, I don't know that you're going to be able to police that uh, as far as not profit or non for profit. As you well know, that you can have a non profit entity and you can make all the money in interior of that but you don't actually right. show any numbers on the actual corporation um, and I don't know how to do that the only reason we put in there the issues with regard to 80% within the school feeder pattern is to make sure that those businesses were local and that they had the majority of their kids from our school feeder patterns yeah. so it's not just the nonprofit it's the nonprofit plus that additional factor in it. that way you couldn't be a nonprofit from Gulf Shores or from Florida and come in here and get the same benefit and you're paying full freight if, you're, if you don't have kids that are local kids in there. So it has to I be can. both then. It has to be both. Meet both sure. criteria. Council, other questions? I had a couple questions and looking at the um, reservation agreement, um, if, if you go down towards the bottom of that first page and then the top of the second page, Things like the skateboard park and the frisbee golf course—is that if you were blocking out the entire uh, courses for an event, or correct not, to have a tournament? Yes. Okay, so mm -hmm. you're not talking about charging a couple of kids that oh, want to no. go up to the skate park. Or no, not at all. So when so the reservation it says reservation. So that's that's if you get a reserved time. Right. There have been I think one or two frisbee golf tournaments. So if they were to block out that time, they would be able to do that for this reservation. Correct? Gotcha. Council, any other questions or comments? Yeah, I thought we'd we'd found a resolution for this a couple of months ago. Did we not? No. Have to go back and look. What they came, and they, I never heard anything that they resolved. What they came back with was a situation that would put one umbrella between rec soccer and academy. And nobody ever, we told them they had to split the two, have two independent parties, and one could help run the other one. And they never came back and said, we're willing to do that. Additionally, if you run it under one umbrella and you make more than $15,000, or it's costing the city more than $15,000, you've got to bid it out. So we run afoul of the bid laws if we go forward with whatever they want. We've been through all this. We'd, we'd I, know, I know, but there, you can't, even if you go bid it out and nobody else bids, but you got multiple bidders, you can't, my understanding is you can't do it. That's what the league and the municipalities told us on that. But it, with it, in regard to that, we don't start a rec league until fall, is that right? In for soccer. So we've got time to iron out any kind of contracts that may be consistent with what you're talking about between now and then. We've got to get them to the table to iron out the details of it to make sure we're in compliance. Do they need an answer before the 15th, though? I just need something temporarily in place to get me through these camps that they're wanting to have on the 15th okay. and throughout the summer, throughout the month of June and July.
I really, uh, you know, take advantage of Mr. Keyser being here and, and, and kind of would it offend you if I ask him? He's been involved Not a bit. in a lot of these discussions no. before. Bob, would I? Is it okay for me to ask you for some feedback? Sure. I mean, I know you've been heavily involved, not only rec board, but you know, soccer leagues, and probably had a hand in almost all the youth leagues at I some did point in time or another. Had a hand in writing most of the agreement that you're looking at there, uh, okay. based on the Auburn uh, model, and you know, the, what we were trying to work towards is how do we get ourselves in compliance and not price ourselves and run everybody off. Right, I mean, exactly. we built a, a $5 million soccer complex out there, and we can real easily chase everybody away and have nobody playing. So the idea is how do we provide the services that our community deserves, which is a recreation program, an academy program, a club program. How do we make that accessible to the residents of Fairhope uh, and do it so that it's not so cost prohibitive. Do you have a preference in the uh, options here? The rec the, board, I don't know if you've seen them. Uh, Pat, does he know the difference I, between the I two? I haven't seen Listen the other there. options. I, I know what was, in the ori what was originally passed by the recreation board. As I say, I drafted that. Uh, that was done in conjunction with talking with the, the rec leagues within the city. Uh, had some consultations with Marcus along the way. And as I say, they were modeled after the Auburn agreements, which is what was, uh, that was supposed to be the, uh, the model by the uh, League of Municipalities. So are you okay with the reservation agreement? Have you seen that? That, I, I just saw that in passing today. Okay, has the rec board seen this? They have not seen that. Okay. And it, I'll tell you just in the quick look, I just thought we were a little more complicated and a little more expensive than we needed to be. Um, you know, as, as you talk about doing things like the lighting and that sort of stuff, uh, again, you're going you're gonna to price, you're going to chase folks out of using our facilities, and I don't think that's what well, our objective is. The rec board is. doesn't include that. So just to let you know that, that I was just trying to, if, if there was a simple way for council to say A or B and, and, and move the needle, uh, or, or, you know, because if we go back to rec board and say, all right, we need a recommendation from you guys, you're going to have to study it, and it's going to get, it's going to be August before we know. Uh, so, if, if counsel, you, are you if with you, me? I'm just trying to, I'm trying to just move the bar here, give them some kind of idea. If you threw it back at me, we're meeting next week, and we would, uh, we would come to resolution on it if, you know, if that was an issue. What we're yeah. really looking for is can we give, a, can we use one of those models, either the one that the rec board came up with initially, can we use that as um, a draft that we can give to the soccer folks that <coughs> they can go ahead and get started based on that um, with the knowledge that this is under review right now and it may get changed. So let uh, me ask Mr. White that question. Let me put the ball back in your court. How, how do you feel about the the fee structure approved by the rec board. I mean, I like I like the simplicity of it. I think it's pretty clean and simple. Uh, and, and that was my initial question to you guys. It, do you want to be um, simple and clean with it, or do we want to look at other fees for other services that we're providing? So, so are these two? Would you, if you, if you adopted the <coughs> structure approved by the rec board, would you not have the reservation agreement? You still have this. They're still separate documents, right? Again, Our, again, that that's going to be up to which direction we want to go. We we could operate with you know the tournaments under this this same simple structure if we chose to. Probably 
and there's no, as far as the other allocation of revenues and expenses, there's nothing in there uh, with regard <coughs> to a camp that would be, you know, that would be even relevant to this. And if they're meeting next week or this week on the uh, with rent board, they can get get a look at this additional uh, document. That we can, all we did really is carve out the tournament and the camps because we want, you know, we want something in there. They're making $130,000 over a weekend on a soccer tournament, and the city's not getting anything with the problem with that. But the issue is that all that, <coughs> that document, and then this other document leaves in here if somebody wants to go just rent the fields is all that is. So um, let me, let me, it, you said a lot right there mm -hmm. and, and a lot of in, invoking a lot yeah. of documents. So if I go to this reservation agreement, that needs to be considered before these camps or not? It, something should be in order to give them a daily rate. Now, if you give them this other one, it's $450 a day per people. So you look at $900 for a two day camp. This would be $500 for a two day camp plus $150 <coughs> for set up and lining. There isn't any type of, you know, gate fee, uh, parking fee split because there is nothing like that associated with camp that we're aware of. I'm just trying to get through, when we're talking about just trying to get through this camp that's going to yeah. start in two weeks. That would kind of give you an idea, but it would give, it gives Pat a, a yeah. security deposit, it gives a damage deposit, and it gives them, um, the field lining money that they need to get, or should get, and then it gives them a daily rate. So, so <clears throat> council, I would, I would just, uh, if, if there's a lot to digest, but I would, yeah. I would be in, in favor of the reservation agreement for now, and then, uh, you know, I, I could take either one of either or of these fee structures right now. Maybe the simpler one for now, the rec board approved. For one thing, it's are it's simpler, and secondly, it's already rec board approved. Well, the, the problem with the rec board, when one you've got conflicting language with the tournament reservation fees, and you've also got amounts already preset for a contract that if you if you have to give that contract out, somebody else may come in and say, "Well, I'll give you, you know, twelve percent, or maybe instead of." Let me go back to this then. Let me try to simplify it a little further then. Can we adopt that tonight? We can adopt that tonight. That'll carry you through the summer. And we can work on the contract with, if there is potential for a contract without any bid, we can work through that between now and you know, the end of July, have them ready to go. Or if we have to bid it out, we can bid it out before that. If, if I might. Please. That's more than what. So if you're running a camp out at Manly, you're paying $50 per field. You, you had indicated $450 per field. It's $50 per field per day. And for a camp, you're typically running two or three fields. So you're looking at at max um, $150. Per day. Whereas you're going $25 an hour if you're using the, uh, the reservation form. Part of... Blair, I was I was assuming full use of the full facility. You're they're maxed, not they're not going you're to maxed out at two fifty per facility with the reservation fee or twenty five dollars an hour per field, whatever that's going to come up. Yeah, I see what you're doing there. <clears throat> so I mean, part of your way is six fifty. The other way is if you're using every field. Yeah, and that allows you every field. But they may not need it. What is the other afford? No, they typically what? use like three fields for the. What, camp. what would it be with the uh, uh, rec board approved? One hundred fifty bucks. One fifty. One fifty. For two days. Three hundred for two days. Isn't it? Yeah, three hundred. Three hundred two days. But the, if the camp is not a two-day camp. I mean it. Right, it'd be a week or something like that, right? Right. Council, what's your pleasure? <clears throat> yeah, Council President, I spent a lot of time on this. It, you recall, you know, several months ago, and I thought we had put this to bed. I, I do not feel comfortable making any decision tonight based on what we've been presented until I have a chance to look back at my notes. So if, what, if there is uh, no, if there's no action taken, what, what becomes of the camp? Is there any charges? You end up pushing them off. Oh, they can't use it because you they're profiting kind of and an using public. You're not you're not legal until you've got some right. kind of. That's what that was my concern. Well, then I would say, you know, adopt the one that the rec board recommended until we have 
do we have time to review in more way. detail? And and so I've had discussions with. I mean, the, they've been talking with me also, and they know what's in that draft agreement that the rec board had approved, and they were comfortable with that, and said, if if we've got to wait until there's a signed one, that's fine. We'll sign what's there if that'll allow us to go ahead and get started. Um, and certainly would buy some time for y'all to look a little deeper into it. Um, Are they going to be day camps only? No night, no nighttime just activities? Just day. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can do just a, a, a man draft resolution if you want a temporary rate schedule for family. If you want to at least do that. No. no, they should just be family. More to temporary rate. rate agreement pursuant to the fee structure approved by the rec board? Yeah, only with regard to the fee structure. Because I said that one, it's got, it's got too much of a potential contract with another party in there. And then we took out the tournament stuff because it conflicts with what this other document says that's been, that's been used. Council, um, would you be okay with that? Yeah, for temporary. <clears throat> Yeah, I'd be, I'd be good with that. I, 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 don't I, wanna, did, I didn't know we were going to have to take some action. Yeah, tonight, I don't but it sounds like if we want these people to be able to yeah. have this camp, that we're going to have to take some action tonight. So I'm, I'm looking for direction. $50 a day per field, and then is there any setup? $30 an hour per staff, any setup fees? Would that be included with your staff? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I guess I don't have a problem with the structure approved by the rec board if it's already been approved by the rec board. Right. That's the thirty dollar per for the staff member that goes up there. And, is that right? They yeah, thirty dollars per hour for per that, staff. That member. typically is not a. There's not a staff member out there. I mean, really, the only place that we see a staff member is when you're running a softball tournament. And you've got to have somebody on site all day to keep relining the fields. And yeah, that's, that's what I didn't know. If that that included lining the fields and the prep, the prep and walking the field, if that was included with the time. They, they typically don't. Want line fields for the camp. I don't, I don't even see it on there. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, can we do that? Temporary rate of fifty dollars per play day per field. Right. Well, we we'll just do the the red board. That's about, fine. It's pretty you know I mean? pretty detailed in there. Um, mm -hmm. I would just say that number nine though should say that eighty percent of the participants are fair uh, feeder reside pattern. within the Fair Hope feeder pattern. That was what our intent was. We just right, sure. Uh, I understand. I'm a lousy lawyer. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Get some clear. I get some clarification on what are we doing. Fee today? structure approved by rec board. I'm hearing. Resolution adopting the fee structure approved right. by the rec board. Right. Fifty dollars a day for play day. Thirty. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think you have to. It's described in there. I mean, yeah. It's all described awesome. in the proposed resolution. Yeah. Right. Other, the other change would just be number nine, and I'll just line through that and say, organizer must show proof that at least 80% of participants are uh, that live within the Fairhope school feeder pattern. That's an easy one. We're at about 95%. Is that good enough for tonight, yes, Pat? Yes. That moved the needle. That's what I needed. Yep. Okay. That moved the needle, Bob. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, we don't have time for an agenda meeting. Um, uh, if you have committee updates, you can give them uh, during your council comments. Uh, let's go ahead and adjourn and come back in just a couple of minutes to get started with the council.